So as most of you know, we're making our way through the book of Mark. After Easter, we'll, start our, uh, we'll, we'll look at the final week of Jesus' life, looking at, starting in chapter 11. Um, I've broken Mark up into series, and the point there is to kind of have these kind of cohesive units. But uh, in between those series, I thought, well, it'd be fun to, to teach through another book. And so we're taking the long view, and in between each series, we're going to pause for a minute and preach through the Psalms. And so Psalm 2 is where we'll be this morning. It's a book full of songs about real life. It packs a lot of truth into small spaces and helps us really understand what worship is is all about. It it shows us the one true God, and it helps us understand what it means to live for Him in our everyday lives. Now, now I don't take a pulse of our culture and then look for a passage to speak to it. So it's interesting to me. I don't want you to think that that I, I saw off into the future and I planned, you know, that this is the week of our primaries that I was going to speak on Psalm chapter two. This was completely coincidental. God knew what he was doing. But in the midst of all the turmoil we're going through in our country, we ended Mark uh, two weeks ago, making Psalm two the passage we're going to look at today, 48 hours before our primaries. And I heard it on the radio this week. You know, I don't even recognize America anymore. Um, what kind of country are we leaving to our kids and our grandkids? There's a, lot, there's a lot of frustration, a lot of worry, a lot of a doubt, a lot of fear. So Psalm 2 is going to help us when our nation is raging. It's going to help you. It's going to help me respond in the right way to our country. And, and, and just the overall feeling in our culture that continues to settle into a position that is anti-God more and more. So this song is going to help us understand world events and and how to respond to world events correctly. There are some quick things I need to say, though, first, before we jump into Psalm 2. These are by way of introduction, kind of big picture things uh, before we jump into the text. So the first thing is that, remember, Psalms, that's just a fancy word for songs, musical poetry sung by Israel in worship. And so this was their songbook. They had a book full of songs. They didn't have a projection system. They didn't have screens. And so they had everything in books. And in those books, these were their songs. So, So so when they sang in worship, they would sing these songs. Second, this is, psalm, this is the second psalm, but that doesn't mean that this is the second psalm written. The, uh, the psalms are not arranged in chronological order. In fact, nobody really knows how these psalms are, uh, are arranged. No one's cracked that code yet. So if you want to be a biblical scholar, you know, you can fi- you know, go to P- get a PhD in, in the psalms and you'll try to figure that out too. Next, I, w- I want you to look at Psalm 3. Look, at, look right above Psalm 3.1. So right above Psalm 3.1, what does it say? It says, it says a Psalm of David, so it tells you who the author is, and it says uh, when he fled from Absalom, his son. So he says, here's the author, and here's the historical circumstance behind this song. So this circumstance led to this song being written. Well, look at above Psalm 2.1. Is there an author or setting, historical setting there? There isn't. And so... As as we we look at that, as we think about that, this song doesn't tell us when it was written. It doesn't tell us what the circumstances were, and it doesn't tell us who wrote it. But thankfully, we have the New Testament. Take a look at Acts chapter 4, verse 24. Two, two authors of this psalm are actually stated, and when they heard it, Acts 4.24, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, he said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage? And the people's plot in vain. So here he is quoting Psalm 2. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. So, so two people wrote this song. Uh, King David, who died around 970 BC or about 3,000 years ago, and God the Holy Spirit, who Peter, who, who the church, the early church says, he, the Holy Spirit used Peter's mouth to write these words. So we know the author, we don't know the setting. What kind of psalm is this? That's another question. This scholars call this a royal psalm because it talks about a king. We read it a little bit. It talks about a king and uh, a king who's in charge of God's people. So many believe this was sung. So here's what would happen. They believe that that when when a king was about to die or or died or or just said, I'm getting too old for this, there would the new king would come up. And when that king was coronated or installed as a king, they would sing this song. So what scholars believe that this was this is so starting with Solomon since David wrote it and sung at the coronation of all the subsequent kings scholars believe this song was sung 
But as you, as you read that passage, and maybe, maybe you, you heard it as we were reading, Psalm 2 talks about um, events that are not in Samuel and not in Kings. There's no time, if, for instance, in Samuel or Kings when, when the entire world was fighting against one king of Israel. Also, it's obvious that this song is, is not about David or any king in the book of Kings because no king, verse 8, was given the whole world as an inheritance. So let's see what the first Christians saw. This allows us to see that this song is more than just 3,000 years old talking about something 3,000 years ago. This song, they said, was about Jesus. This was not just a royal psalm. This was a prophetic psalm. While David may have written this song to describe, because of things going on in his life, to help maybe with the kings of Israel going forward, the Holy Spirit spoke through him about events that David never saw, events that happened almost a thousand years after David died in the life of Jesus, and he wrote about events David did 3,000 years at least after he died, events that haven't even taken place yet. Finally, look at verse 12. By way of introduction, what's the last line in verse 12? It says, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now look at Psalm 1-1, very first verse of the book of Psalms. What does that say? Blessed is the man who doesn't do this and doesn't do that, all right? So, so this song, verse 2, or, or, or Psalm 2, ends where Psalm 1 begins. Blessed at the beginning, blessed at the end. So this has been noticed for centuries. And what, what scholars, some scholars have said is what that points to is that this, was, this may have been, not probably, it may have been one song that over time got split, but really is one song because there's this, it's called inclusio, fancy word for just, you know, this is a circle. It, it ends where it begins. So no one can say for certain that maybe this has always been two songs or maybe this used to be one song that was split for, in two, but either way, the point here is that Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are like two doors that allow you to enter into worship, and God, uh, worship of God. That this, this is two, these are two doors that, that open up the songbook of Israel. So as a person entered into the worship of God, these two Psalms are asking each worshiper a question. Are you friend or are you foe? Because only one can really worship God. The other one must repent before he worships God. So Psalm 2, if you got one of the Bibles from the ushers, page 384, uh, starts with foes. It starts with God's enemies and asks this question. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. These words right here in your Bible are describing an international conspiracy against the authority of God and the authority of his king. Notice verse two, nations and peoples. I'm sorry, verse one, nations and people. These are non-Jewish people. These are, these are non-Jewish nations, which is everybody except one nation, right? And notice verse two, they're meeting together. They're plotting. They're, 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 there's some kind of counsel. There's some kind of planning going on. And notice that, you know, countries in, in the world, they can't agree on politics. They, they can't agree on economics, but they can agree on something. They can be united in something. They want to be free from God. They are seething with antagonism. They are, they're churning with rage. This is, an, a, this is just an, an angry beehive and, and f- a frenzy of activity, all being fueled by rage against God. And this is not a kind of fly off the handle kind of anger. This is a plotting, meditating, thinking, planning their rebellion. And they're all going in the same direction. They are together in their hostility. They're united in their opposition of God. They hate him. They hate his king. This first section begins with amazement. It says, why, you know, why do the nations rage? What are they so mad about? And then verse 3 answers the question. Look back at that again. Here's the voice of the rebels. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Why are they raging? The answer is they're sick of God. They're sick of his ways. They're sick of his influence. They've had enough of God. Their battle cry, the motto that they're rallying around is freedom. We will not have this God rule over us, they proclaim. Bonds and cords in verse 3, these are are, uh, words that are used for slavery. This is their view of God. His rules are not for their good. His laws are not expressions of love, but of control. They want to be free to do whatever they want. 
no restraints on their desires. It's not enough for them to, to disobey God personally. They, want, they do not want the, 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 the smell of God. They do not want a hint of God anywhere they go. They want to be free from him completely. We've been in the middle of this kind of revolution for decades now, haven't we? Whether it's removing crosses and stars of David from military cemeteries, or it's uh, lawsuits against Christian bakers and photographers, or anti-Semitism, or the removal of the Ten Commandments from public grounds, or the legalization of gay marriage, or a whole host of attacks against Christians on college campuses. Our nation is raging against the one true God and against His Son, Jesus Christ. And what Psalm 2 describes is not only happening today, but like we saw in Acts chapter 4 right there, it was happening 2,000 years ago. The nations raged against God and actually killed Jesus. They despised his influence. That's what we've been seeing as we've going, been going through Mark. As the, the disciples don't understand him, as the people are like, hey, give us more free stuff. The, uh, the, you know, do more miracles and let us see just how great you are because we need some food and we need some cool stuff. We need to be healed. Here, here are the religious leaders going, we got to get rid of him. Here's Rome that's going to say, we need to get rid of him. We need to kill him. It's, it's going to be better if this guy dies you know, than, than you know, Rome comes in and causes his problem. They reject his teaching. They'd had enough of him, so they capture him, try him, torture him, and kill him. They wanted to be free from him. And the only way they could do that was by putting him to death. And so what happens is a few weeks later, Peter and the church is reflecting on these events. And this is what we have here in Acts chapter 4. They're reflecting on this, and they're connecting history with what the Bible says, the Old Testament says, and they connected history with Psalm 2. And so you see that again up there. They heard it. They, they lifted up their voice together to God. So here's the church, this early church together, singing to God, Sovereign Lord, made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. Through the mouth of your servant David, your father David, your servant, Said by the Holy Spirit, why do the Gentiles rage? So here he's quoting Psalm 2. But then notice, for truly, let me, let, me under, let me explain who these Gentiles are. Let me explain who these rulers are. Truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod, Pontius Pilate, among them the Gentiles, the Romans, and the Jewish people. In other words, the first Christians pointed at Herod, Pilate, Romans, and the Jews as the rebellious nations, the peoples, the kings, the rulers of Psalm 2. So the question then is, what's the point of all this? Is it just an interesting historical connection? Is there, you know, are they just reading this into to the Bible to make themselves feel better? Like, what's the point here? Well, the early church continues and says this. They're gathered together against your servant Jesus to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. In other words, none of that took God by surprise. He was watching. He's in control. And if that's true, if God's not caught off guard, then how do you respond well when the nations are raging, when our nation is raging against God? Point number one, don't let anti-Godism surprise you. It's my word I made up, anti-Godism. You know, don't let that surprise you. Don't let that catch you off guard. Don't let that be something that, that takes you by surprise. It's like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? John, the, an early follower of Jesus, you know, and Jesus' cousin put it this way, 1 John 3.13, do not be surprised, brothers, when the world hates you. And why would the world hate you? Why, why would they have a problem with you, Christian? Jesus said it like this. They're gonna have a problem with you, John 15.18, because if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Think about it for a second. This psalm was written 3,000 years ago, and yet it's describing something that is more current than tomorrow's newspaper. This song was read when the new king was installed. This song was, was sung by God's people over and over again. And you have to ask, why would this song be sung in a worship service? The answer is because when stuff like this happens, the people of God won't be surprised. It's in black and white for all to see and has been there for three millennia. And second, it's there and sung in, in, in worship services, knowing that this will make us hope for a day when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. That, that as we see the nations raging, as we see uh, the commitment to Jesus being less and less accepted in our culture, 
this passage allows us to find hope and rest, knowing that 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 day will come. And so between now and then, you shouldn't be surprised. It may have taken different forms over the years, but the point here is that it doesn't matter who's in the White House or on the Supreme Court or how many Tea Party conservatives are or aren't elected to Congress. There will always be an anti-God tendency in our culture. So what do we do? One author, Martin Luther, German reformer 500 years ago, commenting on these verses, he said, this is so good. He says to Christians, fortify your conscience. In other words, be strong. And admonished by the Holy Spirit in this passage, understand that the world will be in an uproar, but do not put the blame on this king or his word, but rather on Satan and the godless world. The more eagerly the world opposes this sacred teaching, the more evil and wicked it is. This psalm teaches us that we should cling to the kingdom of Christ, even though all men should rage. For what is it they're raging? Uh, for what is that raging to us? Our peace is truly beyond that tumult and stands secure. Our king remains king, even though the gates of hell and the world oppose him. Satan and the godless world cannot tolerate this king. Learn this so that when the tumult swell, when the the agitators are blocking the freeways, when the nations rage, the people plot, the kings rise up, the rulers counsel together to suppress this king then be in good spirits. Don't let yourself be moved by this peril for the second Psalm foretold that this is the way it would be. Look back at verse one. All their raging, all their plotting, is it gonna be successful? It says it's all going to be in vain. Their plans are foolish. Their plans are pathetic. Like Like playing a video game for 12 hours, defying God is an embarrassing waste of time. Everything they plan is destined to fail. Every single thing. They have no chance of freedom. Why? Because they're, they're taking on God. They, they are an army of worms going against a tank. They have no chance. Spurgeon compared these rebels to waves at the beach. Think about waves. I thought this was so interesting. He writes, waves rise in foam with an angry roar, but in, insta- but in an instance they crash and die on the shore. And that's what happens. They're defying the one, verse 4, Sitting in heaven and doing what? Worrying? You know, is he sitting in heaven afraid? Is God panicking? Oh no, the whole world's against me. No, the voice of the rebels gives way to the voice of God. Verse four, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Isn't that interesting? It's like if if you've ever had a three-year-old or everyone's known a three-year-old, you you were once a three-year-old, but it's like uh, like your three-year-old puffing his chest out going, let's arm wrestle. You know, like multiply that by a trillion and you're just scratching the surface on why God is laughing. What does he have to worry about if the whole world is against him? Isaiah 40, verse 15 is great. It compares every single human being on the planet, all put together, compares them to one drop in a bucket of water, compares them to one piece of dust on a scale. Now, let me ask you, how significant, how important is one drop in a bucket of water? How much does it influence that bucket of water? Not much. How much does, the, does one piece of dust influence the weight on a scale? Not one bit. God is so calm, cool, and collected at every nation on the planet rebelling against him that he sits. You see that? He doesn't even stand. I'm just gonna stay here sitting down. And he laughs. Last week, um, my family got to go to Disneyland thanks to the, the generosity of some very dear friends of ours. And uh, in the late afternoon, there was this parade in California Adventure with, uh, with people, with, with uh, characters from the movie Cars. And my son is addicted to the movie Cars. He would watch it all day, every day if we let him do that. And uh, so he's, he sees this and he's freaking out and he's up on my shoulders and he's watching everything. And then as the, the, uh, the parade was ending, there are these towers along the road that, are, that were shooting out bubbles. Do you know what didn't happen when those bubbles started coming out? People didn't start screaming and running away because they're terrified of bubbles. Nobody looked at that and thought, oh no, the bubbles are coming. Grab the kids, grab the wife. We got to get out of here. We're going to die. 
It started happening. No one screamed. No one saw the bubbles, you know, and protected their kids for dear life. It was like, oh, bubbles, isn't that nice? Let's go touch them. And my son wanted to, like, touch them. And we are as afraid of bubbles as God is afraid of every single human being on the planet being against him. Verse 4, isn't the laughter of hilarity or amusement? It's the laughter of disrespect. The same word for laughter is actually used in Judges 16.25 for Samson, providing entertainment for the Philistines who see their blinded and, and chained enemy is no threat to them at all, so they laugh at him. It's, what's so funny? What's so funny is their arrogance. Like, who do they think they are? Think about Pharaoh for a second. I was reflecting on this. Think about this. So here's Pharaoh. He says, I've got a good idea. All of these Israelites, all of them, they, they, they're, they're causing us problems. They're growing too big. If, you know, if a, another army comes in here, another state comes in here and says, hey, you should beat up the Egyptians. They could easily do it because they really far outnumber us. And so, hey, let's start killing their children. So they start killing you know, Hebrew children, except he misses one. It just happens to be raised by his daughter in his own house, who just happens to be the one God uses to destroy him. And God laughs. This is the laughter of, uh, of Steph Curry when you step up to him and go, let's do a three-point contest right now. This is the laughter of Superman when you go up to him and go, hey, let's do this right now. Arm wrestle. You know, and as Superman is sitting there, uh, you know, yawning while you're trying to take him down, you know, and he's going, oh, have you been working out? You know, mocking you? That's these words here that God's using of the nations. He is mocking them. But tragically, verse 5, their mockery doesn't, God's mockery doesn't laugh forever. God tolerates no opposition forever. His patience runs out. But before he acts, God always speaks. He, he requires absolute loyalty. And if he doesn't get that, he responds with unspeakable terror. And you would expect after reading, look, I mean, look at verse 5. Speak to them in his wrath, terrify them in his fury. And then you would expect it, verse six, to say something like, and I'm gonna grab all of you and squish you like a grape, or I'm gonna cast all of you into the lake of fire. No, it says, speak to them in his fury. As for me, I'm gonna set my king on Zion, my holy hill. What? Verse six is a surprise. It's his response of wrath and terror and fury in verse five is to install his king in Jerusalem located the, at the top of a mountain called Zion. And the point here is that this king will end their rebellion. This king will do to them what they've been raging against. He will rule over them. Well, if this is God's response to the whole world raging against him, then how should we respond to it? Let's take our cues from God in point number two. Let's rest in God's plan when anti-Godism rages. My, my made up word again. Rest in God's plan when anti-Godism rages. When you see the news, are you resting in the plan of God? When you read those political posts on Facebook, are you resting in the plan of God? As each primary goes by, are you resting in the plan of God? As, as it gets harder and harder for Christians to live for God in this culture, are you trusting and resting in the plan of God? Now, I know we aren't God, and I, I know we'll experience the raging of the nations against God, but even still, if, if God is unmoved, then we can use that truth to rest and not worry. We can rest and not doubt. We can rest and not be afraid, even if you're killed for your commitment to Jesus, which is nowhere near what we're experiencing here. Because God sees everything. He knows everything. He knows what he's doing. He's doing 10,000 things that you will never see and never understand, but he knows what he's doing so you can rest in his plan, rest in his control, rest in his goodness. Responding well when the nation's rage is not seen in protesting. It's not seen in raging right back. It's not seen in withdrawal either. It's seen when not, we are resting so well in God that no matter what's happening in our culture, no matter how much we're hated, we don't respond in kind, but we bless our enemies instead. It's seen in resting so well in the plan of God, just like Jesus. Here he is experiencing the plan of God, and it's painful, and it hurts, and his response is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We can, if we are resting so well that we can actually do good to those who harm us, do good to those who hate us, and not take it in kind. That's what it looks like to rest. As we enter verse 7, the speaker changes a third time. We started with the rebels, and then we went to God, and now we, we see the king, the Lord Jesus, who takes center stage. Look at verse 7. I will tell of the decree. That's, the, that's Jesus speaking. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. 
Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. God's king looks into the faces of this angry mob and tells them God's conclusion on the matter. You belong to God and your days are numbered. The exact opposite of everything they want to hear. This is the establishment of the very kingdom that they're raging against. And this king is no puppet. Look at, look at verse, verse 7. He has a very special relationship with God. He's called the, the king. He's, he's called God's son. And Hebrews 1 helps us understand this. You want to turn to Hebrews chapter 1. It's, uh, you know, you go, get to Revelation, you've gone too far. Or any book that's named after a person, you've gone too far. Hebrews chapter 1. Again, the, this is one of the most quoted psalms in all of the New Testament. And so we get a, a glimpse into what this psalm means by looking at the New Testament and seeing how they understood it. And in Psalm 1 verse 4, it starts this process of explaining what the passage we just looked at means. So Psalm 1 is talking about, or I'm sorry, Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 is talking about Jesus. In these last days, verse 2, he's spoken to us by his son. And then verse 4, having become as much superior to angels. So Jesus is superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And here now he's going to prove that, that God, that Jesus is greater than any angel. Verse 5, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels worship him. Okay, angels are worshiping the son now. Of the angels, he says, he makes them flames of uh, winds and ministers a flame of fire. So angels don't worship each other. They don't worship other angels. They only worship God. And if the angels are worshiping the this, son this, this person, and he must be God, and then he makes it clear, the writer does. But if of the Son, he that's God says, your throne, O God, is forever. So here's God calling the Son God. Your throne, O God, is forever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, referring to the Son, your God, referring to the Father, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. The point here is this. The king is no puppet, he is the son of God. And the son of God means that he is God, meaning he has all the power of God. It means that he's gonna care about everything God cares about, which means he's gonna do everything God wants to do. And then you come to the most difficult part. Look back at, at Psalm chapter two, or Psalm two in verse seven. The most difficult part of this passage to understand is this last part in verse seven. You are my son, today I have begotten you. What is that all about? Thankfully, the New Testament helps us again as to what day, when, when did this happen? What day was, was Jesus begotten as the Son of God? Here's uh, Acts chapter 13. Paul is speaking and he interprets this part of the passage of Psalm 27 for us, where he says, we bring you the good news that, that, that God promised to the fathers, that he has fulfilled to us, their children, the, the children of the fathers, by raising Jesus who it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son today, I've begotten you. So it's the point there. The point is this, according to Paul, the fulfillment of Psalm 2-7, today I've begotten you, happened when Jesus rose from the dead. And this connects with Romans 1-4. You can write this down and look at it later. Romans 1-4 says, Jesus was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. So there is a connection between being declared for all the world to know that Jesus is the king and that Jesus is the son of God, that he's God with skin, and it connects to the resurrection. It connects to what we're celebrating next week. So at the first Easter, the, the point here is that Jesus is coronated. He is made king, and he's not just made king of, of one part of the world. He's made king, as we see in Psalm 2, over the entire world. He's installed as God's king, exalted to the supreme position of king over every king ever who's ever lived. And then we have this strange request. Look at verse 8. It's a very strange request. The, the king doesn't ask that he be given power to subdue the rebellion. He doesn't, he's not, he's, he doesn't say, you know, give me everything I need to exterminate all of your enemies, God. Notice what he asks for. Verse 8. You, you know, I, I just, 
I'll give you the nations as your, your heritage, your, your inheritance. The ends of the earth is your possession. He's God. And he, doesn't he have all that already? Here's what he's asking for. Here's what Jesus is asking for. He wants all of those rebels to be trophies of his grace. All of those nations, all of those people that are just raging against him and hate him. He says, God, I want all of those people to be mine. I want all of those people to be with me. He wants the same rebels who hate him, who can't stand him, who want nothing to do with him to be his inheritance, to be his gift, to be his prize. So we not only read, you know, we not only read verses one to three and say, you know, we're experiencing verses one to three, but in that moment, it's easy for us to, to look at what's happening in our world and go, oh Lord, like how long until you wrap things up? Like destroy your enemies. Can you see what they're doing? Why aren't you doing anything about this? Stop them, judge them, end this. Jesus, come back. But verse eight says, we see God saying, I am doing something about it. I'm turning rebels into trophies of my grace. So what can we learn from this? How can we respond when our nation is discarding God, uh, his view of the family or his view of marriage or his view of the sanctity of human life or his view of sexuality or God's view of anything? They're just discarding it. How can we respond to that? How can we respond when verse eight reminds us that God loves rebels? Point number three, love God's enemies. Pray they'll be shown grace. That's how we respond. We love God's enemies. That's how we respond. We pray, God, show them grace. Open their eyes. Help them see what they're doing. Help them see the insanity of fighting against you. So when you see our nation raging on television or on Facebook posts, love God's enemies. Pray for God's enemies, not just in the larger culture, but, but love and pray for God's enemies in your families, in your, in your, in your classmates, at your jobs, the enemies of your neighbors. There probably weren't any, aren't any Jewish people in this room. If there are, that's great. But most of the people in this room are not Jewish, which means this. When this psalm was written 3,000 years ago, all of our ancestors were not worshiping God. All of our ancestors were these people. They were all, all anti-God. They were all worshiping idols. They all were hating God, discarding him, forgetting him, wanting nothing to do with him. And yet fast forward 3,000 years, and here you are. And here I am, trophies of grace. It's easy to wish you were the judge and the jury and the executioner when God's enemies get the upper hand in our country. But unlike us, he's patient. First Timothy 2, 4, desiring all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So he sits in heaven and he laughs for now. Let's say you're visiting the Grand Canyon and you saw a complete stranger blindfolded walking right to the edge of the cliff. I don't think any of you sitting here would uh, sit there and watch and go, idiot, take off your blindfold. Like, what's wrong with you? You know, figure it out, dummy. We'd scream, like, stop. Like, don't move. You're in danger. Let me help you. Why don't we do that when we see God's enemies? I remember the president of the seminary I went to, he was, he was asked to do an hour show on, uh, on Larry King. And it was going to be an hour with him and a gay activist. And, and he's like, I'm, I'm going to go in and I'm going to do this. And so I remember the buzz around campus uh, when, when we heard that that was going to happen, when the announcement went out and they said, okay, please pray for Dr. MacArthur so that, you know, he, he does, you know, he does well and all of that. And as, as students, you know, the buzz was happening. The students were like, oh, you know, he's going to get him. The verbal boxing match is going to take him out with God's word and, you know, God's view of sexuality and all of that stuff. It's going to be, he's going to be defended. That sinner is going to be defeated. And then you watch the show. And the president of the seminary, John MacArthur, he was so kind and he was so gracious. He didn't compromise the Bible at all, but he was gentle and pleading with this actor to repent of his sins and to, and to, to embrace the love and mercy of Jesus. And so the next day as I'm coming to class, I'm going like, yeah, that's right. That's what he should have done. And all of my classmates are like, what did he do? I don't understand. They didn't like how he performed. And so he just happened to be speaking that day in chapel. And he looked out at all of us because he knew the buzz and he looked out all, and this made such an impact on me. It continues to this day. He looked at all of us and he said, how in the world could I get mad at that guy? The only difference between him and me is grace. That's it. There's no more difference. He's dead in his sins. He's blind. My anger will not change that. 
There's no difference between him and me except grace. And in fact, this, this blew me away. If you look back at the passage, if Jesus is installed as God's king in his resurrection, and then he asks his father for the inheritance of people, then these wor- listen to these words. These words have greater meaning now. Matthew 28, 18 to 19. Jesus came to them. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I'm the king. I'm now the ruler of the nations. I've risen from the dead. I've been installed now. I'm, I'm the king. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Why? Because I asked the Father to give them to me already. Acts chapter one, verse eight. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The same words in verse chapter two, verse eight as well. So God gives the, think about this. God gives the inheritance to the son of all the nations. And just like he asked for in verse eight, and then God fulfills that promise. How does God fulfill the promise of giving the, all the nations to Jesus? He fulfills it when you and I go help people come to know, love, and serve Jesus. He uses us to give this gift to his son. Last night, Katie and I went to Dave and Buster's to celebrate the birthday of our neighbor. He and his family are Mormon. Um, but our mission here is to help people know, love, and serve Jesus. So a couple hours with him, his wife, his friends, uh, meant to just build a relationship with them, to try to get to know them, to love them. And I don't tell you that to be the hero, because I'm, I'm no hero. I'm, I'm a sinner in need of, 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 of a Savior just like everybody else. But I tell you that because I know if our mission doesn't capture my heart and change my motivations and change my actions, then it'll never change yours. So as you think about your neighbors, do you pray for them? You pray for the lesbians at your school. You pray for the homosexuals at that coffee shop. You pray for people who are proud of their abortions. You pray for people who do things they hope stay in Vegas. You pray for the actors and actresses who just keep pushing the moral uh, envelope. You pray for the kids at school that nobody likes, the kids that, that seem far from God. Allow God to give you the soft heart that verse eight says that he has for rebels. And by the way, if he did not have a soft heart for rebels, then this room would be empty. In fact, this building wouldn't even be here. However, there's a day coming when the laughter stops. Look at verse 9. God gets up. And as they say, when the playwright steps onto the stage, the play is over. This is verse 9. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The nations of this world, including our own, seem strong and powerful, but compared to God's king, they're as fragile as a bubble or fine china. The rod in verse nine is a weapon of war. It's an instrument of correction. And when he uses it on his enemies, they will be no match for him. They will have no chance of resisting him. They are weak and brittle, unable to stand the least amount of pressure put onto them by God. And like China, Once it's crushed, there's no hope of putting it back together again. The same way, when these rebels are attacked by Jesus, their their ruin is inevitable and irreversible. And notice the context. Who is the king breaking and dashing to pieces? He's breaking and dashing to pieces, verse 8, the nations, the ends of the earth, the whole world. Well, question, when did that happen? When, when did it happen that one of the Old Testament kings uh, uh, went to war against the whole world and defeated them easily, you know, like a baseball, fat, a baseball bat defeats a bubble? When did that ever happen? Hasn't happened yet. The raging we've been talking about, that David has been describing here, happened in David's day in some ways, happened in Jesus' day in some way. It's happening in our day right now, and it's going to happen even worse in the future. When the whole world will rage, and set itself up even more than it is today against the one true God and against Jesus Christ and against his people. Listen to John as he explains this. Revelation chapter 19. You can turn there if you like. Last book of the Bible, almost the last chapter in the Bible. Again, John, who is a great name, John um, takes Psalm 2 and he applies it to the future. Revelation 19, verse 11, Then I saw heaven opened, saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. This is Jesus. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, many crowns. 
He has a name written no one knows but himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And here's our passage. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and all men, both free and slaves, small and great. And I saw the beast, the king of the earth, with their armies gathered to make war against him. Here it is, all the nations saying, we're going to kill God, we are going to destroy him. Here's the whole world going after him who is sitting on the horse and against his army. It's like there's no battle. Beast was captured, with him the false prophet, who's in the presence, done signs by which he deceived the world. They're thrown into the lake of fire. Verse 21, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Psalm 2 has a day coming. This is the future of all those who rebel against God. And Psalm 2 concludes, though, not in verse 9. It concludes with verses 11, 10, 11, and 12. And look at verse 10. Now, therefore, if this day is coming, if this day is a reality, verse 10, now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Think about this. Consider this. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. The song ends with a fourth voice, the voice of the writer of this psalm, and he's inviting the rebels to repent. He has no desire to see them suffer. He doesn't gloat over their destruction. He doesn't sit there and go, ha ha, you're getting what you deserve. The message of, of verses one to nine is driving them to, to wake up, to say, listen, look what's going on. Your resistance is futile. Your hostility is foolish. The only reasonable, wise thing for a rebellious man to do is surrender. This is like the mercy uh, uh, policeman show when someone has hostages or someone is barricaded in a, in a, in a building. Before guns start blazing, they, they communicate with the criminal. They say, here's the situation. We've got your place surrounded. Think things out. Accept the reality of the situation in. You are going to lose. There is no hope for you now. And why do policemen do that? Because they want a peaceful resolution. They're giving the criminal a chance to give up. They're giving the criminal grace before everything starts falling down on them. In the same way, God, God will show his wrath, no doubt, and it will be horrible. But until he does, he's merciful, full of mercy. Look at verse 11. God, through this song, shows us when we tell someone about Jesus, when, when, when we're doing the same things that the cops are doing, we're giving them terms of surrender. We're saying, you don't want to experience his wrath. Verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. All of this is the language of worship. Recognize God's greatness. Bow in awe before him. He is great and we are puny. Embrace his lordship over you. And it might sound contradictory. Verse 11, how do you rejoice with fear? That's like, you know, jumbo shrimp. Like, what is that? It sounds like a contradiction. But here's the thing. Fear, the idea here quickly is that fear, um, respect without joy is torment. And joy without fear when it comes to God is disrespectful. So, he's, so God's not a terrorist and God's not your pal. He's not your boyfriend. He's not your girlfriend. He's God. So we approach him with joy because we get to approach him, but we, but we approach him with trembling knowing that he's God. Not head held high, but verse 12, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Kissing the son is not on the cheek. It's not on the lips. It refers to the practice of conquered kings. When, when a king conquered another people group and that people group had a king and that king survived, what they would do is they would force that king into the throne room and the, the king, the victor king would be sitting there on his throne and one of his shoes would be off. And that conquered king would be forced to walk into that throne room, get down on his knees and kiss his feet. 
And that's what this is talking about here. It's an act of homage and respect. It's a posture of submission and surrender. It's the recognition that you are in his control. You stand before the one who at any moment could suddenly end your life. So again, when we see the nations raging, we see our nation becoming more and more anti-God, how should we respond? Point number four, ask. So you're seeing this play out in front of you. Ask, am I raging or am I repentant? Am I defiant or am I rebellious? Am I fighting or have I surrendered? Am I a friend or am I a foe? How do you know which one you are? Well, verse three says that the, the enemies of God, they're like, we don't wanna follow God. We don't wanna do what he says. We wanna free ourselves from him. Consider his rules. Consider the lifestyle he expects you to live. Is that a burden for you? You know, that you're like, I need to get free from that or is, it a, or is his burden easy and light? All of his rules, are they, are, they, are, are they interpreted by you as slavery or are they interpreted by you as, as cords of love and mercy? How do you know which one you are? Have you kissed the son? Have you surrendered to him? Have you said to him, I give up, I surrender to you? Many think they have a relationship with God, a relationship that'll make them safe when they die, but they, they live with disrespect towards him. The song ends with hope for all who would lay their weapons down. Look at it, how it ends. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So the question then is, are you on the path to blessing or on the path to him smashing you? His happiness isn't found in, in freedom uh, uh, that, that's separated from God. There is no freedom from God. That, that, that freedom doesn't exist. Happiness isn't found in overturning his rules for your life. You were created to find your happiness not apart from God, but in God. So find safety from his wrath, find rest from his raging. If you, if you remain his enemy, there is no refuge for you from God, but there is refuge for you in God. Only by kissing, by surrendering to the son, by trusting in his love, by saying, I give my life to you, I surrender to you. You are the king, I kiss your feet, you're in charge, I'm not. I give my life to you. You died and rose again, you deserve everything, you are the king. And verse 12 is clear. Notice it says his wrath can be kindled quickly. Don't wait another minute, this, verse, this, this passage is ending. It's saying, don't wait another second. At any moment, that line could snap and we could perish. Don't leave here today without answering the question, are you friend or are you foe? Let's pray. Jesus, what an incredible song. What an incredible song is we... Look out on our world, this song helps us understand how to respond. It's help, it helps us see the world the way you see it, and, and it gives us insight in, in where our hearts should go, where our motivation should be, how we should live, and what we should learn from what we're watching. That as the, the people of Israel sang this song over and over and over again, the end of this song was challenging them which person am I? Which person am I? Am I a friend or am I a foe? God, do that challenge in our hearts this morning. Just like Psalm 1 begins with blessing and Psalm 2 ends with blessing, that's really what this passage is all about. Are we going to live a blessed life? Is our life going to be blessed? It is when, when, when Psalm 1, we're, we're meditating on your word daily. And it is when we've turned from our rebellion, we've surrendered to you and said, you're the king, you're in charge. That is the blessed life. God, may everyone in this room experience that. For the glory of your name.